questions. Thank you. All right. So, uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to today's meeting. Uh, just so we can remind everybody who everybody is, let's go around the table to introduce ourselves and uh, your position with your agency. Mitch, we'll start with you. I'm going to say this and I want to say a word while I'm going to say this. 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 I'm Jessica Meyer with Big Friends. I'm Zane Gunner. I'm Penny County Manager. I'm Jan Fortuna. I'm sitting in for Serena and I'm the finance director for Waco Santa. Eric Hoffman with the City of Waco System Building. I'm Jimmy Owens. Shannon Rogers. I'm with the Community College and I help students find resources that they can stay in school. Uh, Grace and me, also with McLean Community College, uh, but I'm here on behalf of the Bicycle and Western Work. And you are? I'm Paul Kane, City of Waco. All right. So, Dan Frank, we will argue today. Super. Thank you all for coming. Has everybody had a chance to look at the agenda? Any packet? Any pages? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, okay, so I guess then we have people online. Which is like, do we need to say who they are? Yes, we have um, Art Gibson, and for some of you who may not know, you're familiar with Rizda Gonzalez from the text document for, um, for the city of Big Wendio. And we have Todd Gibson, who is um, he's going to be our new text doctor. So he's here, and we also have. And we also have Barbara Maley and Vizita as well. Okay. And we had one more person walk in the door. Can you stay who you are or who you're with? Hi. Emily Green. I am with the Wake and McLennan County Public Health District. Thank you, Emily. All right. So we have the agenda, and I guess we'll just start down the agenda. Um, the MPO strategic. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, we have one. Very important introduction to me. Uh, for all of you, I would like to introduce Daniela Gallegos uh, to you. Um, you will be hearing from her uh, more frequently, um, not just more frequently, a lot of emails you were getting from Annette. When you see uh, Daniela's name on it, do not be surprised. She joined the MPO uh, two weeks ago. And, uh, and, and with the MPO work, of course, it takes a while um, to get familiar with um, all the rules that we must follow, uh, but she comes from Waco Family Medicine with a tremendous amount of experience and knowledge within the city of Waco, so we are very excited to have her today um, the idea. And so would you like to say a few words? I'm just very excited to meet Danny, you know, that really does, um, and I see everything that you guys say to the name. <laughs> I've heard a lot about y'all. <laughs> All right, um, so our first item on the agenda is to for consideration and action regarding uh, recommendation to the policy board to adopt the recommendation from the MPL strategic plan. As you know, there was a group of individuals, uh, they were called themselves the strategic planning work group and met for many, many weeks 
to come up with uh, approximately five items that we uh, wanted to recommend to the policy board. And uh, I don't know if we have those five items listed. We do. But uh, there we go. Super. So this strategic plan work group was formed to evaluate and recommend strategic goals for the future success of the Wake Hill MPO. Uh, we're motivated by possible reasonization as a transportation management area, and which with that includes additional responsibilities and additional funding. Uh, it affects on the growth and mobility needs across the MPO planning area, and the MPO planning area is McKinney County. The work group appointed uh, to develop a three to five year strategic plan, February 2022. Uh, this work group consisted of two policy board members, which was uh, Bo Thomas uh, and uh, Jim Holmes. Bo's with the city of Kewitt and Jim's with the city of Waco. And technical advisory committee uh, members, which was Amy Burrow. Early, early, thank you, and myself. And then the citizens representative was Amy Dupree, Lorraine. And uh, so we reviewed the potential strategies and changes to the MPO process and what we're currently doing and kind of where we're going to have to go. The objectives were to prepare the MPO to become a transportation management area. Or whether the MPO is functioning similar to our peers of our same similar size throughout the state, and ensure that the MPO has necessary tools to make the best decisions for the entire metropolitan area. Um, so, our recommendations for the policy board is uh, primarily to, well, one of them is to address our regional identity, to concur with or modify the work of our work group and the contents of the document that we put together. Change the MPO name to promote a more regional and inclusive nature. Request a redesignation of the MPO from the City of Waco to the Policy Board. We designate the Policy Board to be solely responsible for hiring, firing, and oversight of the MPO director. Approve the creation of a short video of promotional materials to educate the public about the MPO's purpose. We collaborate with potential stakeholders to highlight the MPO's purpose. Now, I'll pause there. That's, that's a mouthful because people can read it on the screen there. And they, of course, they, they have it in their agenda packet. Does anybody have any questions? Would like to make any comments regarding the uh, proposed? Items for the policy board. Okay. So just a little bit to add there to that a little more color. It does not change our functioning the way we function. So City of Baker is our fiscal sponsor and we manage all of our activities on behalf. So we'll continue to do that and that will actually carry forward even with some of the other proposals that you'll be seeing about the carbon reduction program and says the city of Wake will still provide all of those services. But the main distinction is really how it works out on paper. So there's a planning agreement that gets signed among the fiscal sponsor, the MPO, and the text art. And currently, the way that um, document looks like is that it designates the city of Waco as the MPO, whereas the more common practice is to designate the MPO funds board as the MPO. And the way it changes then is that hiring and, and, and firing and evaluation of the uh, director becomes the responsibility of the policy board. It still gets done through the human resource and other activity that the fiscal agent, but it's the, uh, but the lead person that becomes the policy board. That's what the redesignation is. There was a lot of discussion related to how many people are familiar with what NPO does. And that was the argument um, put forward that we need to make it even more outreach effort as well as have promotional videos and, and talking points so that we can explain uh, what we do. And at the same time, um, it was also emphasized and 
in some ways, some of these are as you can already see. So this is a, I, I, I distinctly remember when I came here, our first CAC meeting had, um, had Annette, Chelsea, and I in the big conference room. Everyone else was virtually joining. We just gave everybody um, an update on everything that had happened. We had, um, we didn't have a chair by chair. We didn't have any formality to it. Um, and we had uh, probably about six or seven people that joined. We gave them an update and in about 20 minutes or 25 minutes we were done. But we already are in, this represents in fact a significant progress to the very last one that we have about collaborating with um, stakeholders. Um, and so in that sense, that's been the recommendation. I can very safely say that we've already made a key work for us in that. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, so, oh, yeah, Frank, yeah. So, at this point in time, we are waiting for um, census to make its final definition of urban area um, official. And they are expected to do that sometime by the end of this year. Once they do that, federal administration will probably take additional three or four months or so to make it official whether we are. Uh, um, in terms of our own internal evaluation, what our, our, when we look at our numbers, what it looks like is that if McGregor is included as continuous urban area, then there's a very good chance that we would reach the 200,000, uh, would be uh, a bit higher than that. But in the last census, McGregor, City of McGregor and the City of Great Boundary, US 84 was not considered urban area, so it was considered not connected. It was not part of the continuous area. So if McGregor gets included, depending on how the urban area definitions play out on US 84, uh, then I feel pretty confident that it will become a TMA. But if McGregor is not included, it's, I don't think we have um, added enough population in other areas to compensate. So we should know by early January from the census definition and officially by March or April. So it's the, it'll be the considered the 2020 census. census that we will learn what the answers are in 2023, three years later. Um, I thought I'd give a little bit more information about each of these bullet points because this is a pretty big deal. I mean, we, we're trying to create a document. Um, we created a document to give to the policy board for their for them to hopefully approved, and for you all to understand what each of these, give you a little bit more background as Pakesh just did to some extent. The very first bullet, concur with mo or modify the work group contents of this document. Okay, well let's, we're gonna give the document, and if they have any issues with it, then they can modify. Uh, change the MPO name to promote a more regional uh, identity. So right now, our MPO is called the Waco MPO. If you're in, but the MPOs consist of like 19 cities in the county. It's not just Waco, but uh, that's what it's called because back when it was created, uh, things were smaller than it. And they just, let's just call it Waco MPO. Well, to be more inclusive of all the other cities that create that are part of the MPO, we thought a name change would be in order. We kicked around a, two or three different ideas, and that decision of what the name will be will be discussed by the policy board. But one of the leading thoughts or ideas would be something similar to the Heart of Texas NPO. That way, you know, in, in this area, it's either Central Texas or Heart of Texas. And so we thought one of those might be a good, good idea. Request for redesignation from an NPO metropolitan planning organization from the uh, city of Waco to the policy board, as we just said, the city of Waco serves kind of two roles. They're the fiscal agent. They get the money from the federal government or federal government goes from the federal government to, to TxDOT, TxDOT to the city of Waco to disperse for NPO items. So they're the fiscal agent, but then they're also the uh, actually the MPO. Um, and we're trying to get it we're recommending that the MPO become the policy board, and the policy board has representative from every city, including the county, so that everybody's represented then. And it's the MPO, MPO, the actual organization, is the policy board, which is represented by everybody 
in the area, the urban area, which is more, which is the county, in the county board. Uh, the next one is uh, for the policy board to be solely responsible for staff, uh, for the MPO staff. Uh, right now, there's uh, the board is not responsible for the staff. The city of Waco is because Waco is the MPO. So if the policy board becomes the MPO body, it would make sense that the MPO body would hire staff, fire staff, regulate staff, and that's what that, that item is. Uh, and then approve the creation of promotional materials and videos. We want the general public to understand who the MPO is and what our purpose is. Right now, if you ask anybody on the street, hey, you know what the MPO is, what they did? Most people say, I don't know what you're talking about. So we thought, uh, our work group thought that one of the things that the MPO should do is to start creating promotional materials and videos and social media and get it out that this is who we are and how what we're about and how ultimately it will impact you, the regular citizen, through funding of public improvements such as roadways, sidewalks, bike trails, other things. Um, so want more publicity, I suppose, in a good way. And then the last one is collaborate with potential stakeholders to highlight the NPO's purpose, which kind of goes together with the previous one. So I hope that clarifies a little bit where we're heading, we're hoping to head. That's in the document that the work group put together that we will present to the upcoming policy board at their next meeting. And hopefully they will vote to approve it and then we'll go from there. So does anybody have any questions? Do what? Three more recommendations. There they are. I'm, I'm, I'm cutting ourselves short here. All right, direct uh, TAC, which is you all, the Technical Advisory Committee, to develop a project selection process to solicit and review project ideas, uh, which would be so right now, well, where we're hoping to go with this is that we can create a, a process where if you think, if you see a need and you say, hey, it'd be great to have this roadway approved. Bicycle trails over here, sidewalks over there. We need something with our transportation approved. You could submit it, um, your ideas, it will be recorded. We're thinking something like online where it'd be easy because now everybody has a survey online, or online survey or online input uh, method. And then we could record that. And then of course that has to get fleshed out by the entities. So if it's somebody out of McGregor, somebody out of Hewitt, somebody out of, you know, Mart, wherever, they they want some project, well then they need to have somebody to kind of uh, push that project and get behind it. And um, if it gets recorded, then we have it on the list and we won't forget about it. And then we know, remember who was pushing that project. And then what steps were taken to kind of try to find fund those, that, those projects. That's the idea behind the project selection uh, review, solicit review process. The next item there is authorize the TAC, you all, and the MPO staff to identify and evaluate supplemental funding opportunities, for example, grant opportunities. So there's a lot of grants out there, both federal state grants. Um, and not everybody knows about those grant opportunities. And so, for instance, let's say there's a federal grant out there for, I'm just gonna say sidewalks, could be bike trails, could be anything. So say the city of Waco uh, puts in for the grant, uh, maybe Hewitt, McGregor, Riesel, Mark, they, they'd like to have some of that too. Well, they don't need to recreate the wheel. They could kind of basically copy and paste the, whoever's done the original grant, put their name in it, or maybe we go together and we combine the different cities together uh, that want that similar funding. And maybe that has more impact if more cities are together asking for that money. So that's what that, uh, that idea is to identify and evaluate supplemental funding opportunities. And then also in the long run, MPO staff would maybe hire somebody 
to help do all the grant writing and keep track of it all and to reach out to each of those cities say hey you know, this we have a grant here it's this much money do you know of any ideas do you have any projects in mind so we can then evaluate all the projects not just one city or another city. that's kind of the thinking there the last item uh, encourage TAC to develop small work groups for our bylaws to address future needs and maintain an understanding of current and expected issues in the metropolitan area. So we, we kind of already uh, through our TAC bylaws, we've, we've created some small work groups such as Bach and Bed Group, um, but uh, we have, have other work groups that they're defined in our bylaws, but they're not working yet because they're not people haven't said, signed up said yeah I'll, I'll be on that work group so uh you know that it, we're in the infancy of, of, of all of that we're, we're, we're getting started so uh, anything else you want to add yeah, totally fast to that yeah so over the next five years uh, it's really important for all of us to be aware of that infrastructure bill has created once in a lifetime unfortunately and we all need to really be cognizant and be very aggressively pursuing and so some of the work we have already started um and so we are already familiar with the safety grant proposal that we submitted today we're going to talk about reconnecting communities grant as well and the carbon reduction program but along with that there are other opportunities that are coming online as well and we need to pursue them as vigorously as we can and uh, with the MDO staff at this point in time, it's just three of us. And so it is really difficult to, um, for us. So when we use to, to cover the entire gamut, and so it is important that as you all see, if we can help, because many times what happens is that, um, so we do hear about some <coughs> projects, but MDO may not be the appropriate entity to take the lead over. It really needs to be some other entity that needs to lead it. And so collaboratively, if you come across something which we can provide any assistance, we are more than happy to do that. And similarly, as something comes up to our, on our radar, we'll reach out just to add something new that came out about an hour before this meeting. I saw there's a new program that, um, that USDOT just announced called um, the Thriving Communities Program. And the idea is that a lot of smaller municipalities do not have the capacity to write grants for, um, for these federal um, grant programs. And so what they, and they're aware of it. So they are going to be funding some of the agencies who can provide that kind of assistance to small municipalities or rural communities, especially. That just came out an hour ago. We will, um, so we couldn't add, add that to the agenda today, but we'll put it on our agenda for the next uh, meeting and we'll probably send out an email. So whenever these opportunities come up, nobody sent the emails out, but whenever we can help and collaborate, by all means, that's the idea behind this record. Very good. So, uh, if I understand things correctly, we need the TAC to hold a vote to approve this document to be submitted to the uh, policy board for consideration and approval. So, uh, does anybody want to make a motion to uh, approve this document? Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, Frank, second. Now we have time for discussion. And anybody have any questions or want to discuss that, that document? I think I'd just like to thank Mikesh for bringing this forward. It's, this is really the way the most of the people are going organized um, with regard to the policy board and those kind of things. So I think it's an appropriate step to take. From a regional perspective, it makes sense for us as well. So, we'll support. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, so, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, Any opposed? It's unanimously passed. All right. So, we'll move on to the second item on our agenda. For consideration and action regarding recommendation to the policy board to adopt a carbon reduction program project evaluation process. 
So um, at the last meeting, we uh, discussed, okay, we, we provide some background on what this program is, and, uh, and this is part of the same part as the infrastructure law, and it is designed to reduce uh, emissions. It is understood rather narrowly about what we mean by emission. Largely, we're talking about transportation-based uh, emission and how can we reduce them. Now, for the way this program is a little different is that the money from federal US DOT has been uh, allocated directly to the NPO. So NPOs are supposed to go ahead and administer uh, this fund. And what this means is for us, for the current year, the total allocation is five hundred twenty-nine thousand dollars And um, that's what the same amount we're expecting over the next five years. And the monies can be allocated for a period up to three years from the, uh, from the year in which it becomes available. And so our responsibility is to uh, identify projects inside so that um, some of these projects based on the 8040 uh, sharing model, they can be uh, they can found out. So. so for us, what is important is that this would be the first time and in some ways, one of the major recommendations from the strategic planning work group was to develop a call for proposal and evaluation process. So this is kind of a, you can treat this as a call for proposal light. Um, so we have a very small um, amount of funding that we're talking about and we're expecting, so this will also give us an understanding of how will this process work out. And the TAC is going to be leading this process uh, more than anybody else. From the staff, we'll support this. So today, what is important for us is to have a sort of discussion on what would that process actually look like. And so the way we are the way we are expecting to go about it is that we establish how we evaluate the project proposal. Then the TAC recommends the evaluation process to the policy board. And then on at the October 20th meeting, policy board can modify or, or revise the process. And after that, what is going to be important in order to actually fund these projects, we will have to make an amendment to our TIP and MTP and ensure that these projects that we recommend to the policy board and the policy board adopts them immediately is followed by a recommendation in our MTP. And after that, the last thing that is also going to be the first time for us is that we will be tracking the project process itself because we want to make sure that the projects as they are um, being delivered, we don't lose out the funding if they actually get completed. So, um, so, so the way we are considering, and again, this is interrupt me any moment, I it's just not, uh, final presentation on this. The idea is that we open a call for proposal for the CRP project funding, and then all the interested local units of government, this is one of the things that we decided that it was important that anyone who had a project idea should still get the project through their units of government, rather than uh, through, you know, personally uh, proposing it. And um, they will use our project submission form that we will talk about briefly. And then um, the TAC will create a work group to evaluate and prioritize those projects. Available. So basically, you all will use the selection criteria and weight those projects and rank them in terms of priority. And that's the ranked project list that we'll present to the policy board for their approval. So, um, so today, some of the things we want to decide upon is that what would that project submission form might look like? And how each how are we going to actually determine um, the, how are we going to apply the prioritization criteria? A little bit more background on this: that we had a very wonderful discussion during the life and work group meeting on this, the entire idea of carbon reduction and how might we go about it. Areas where we have um, limitations according to federal guidelines or according to text or guidelines, which are where, um, that have not been finalized yet. Um, but it allows us some amount of leeway about what we can do uh, locally here. And based on that, those were the four very important uh, considerations that we identified that must be reflected in our evaluation criteria. So the first is the transportation emission. That's a requirement uh, by, under this crowd reduction program itself. Equity is also a requirement, but we wanted to expand the definition to go beyond the area of persistent poverty definition or disadvantaged group, and in fact, start considering also impact on future generations. And the last thing that came out very importantly during that meeting was that we need to be thinking about these projects holistically about how do they fit into the overall quality of life issues and which considerations within the city. Now we needed to reduce them to some very specific points. So that's what we did. If we can click on the uh, link so that we can share what these look like. And we are in your package, by the way, and, and also on our website.
Is it not clicking up? Okay. Hey, um, everybody has to see Okay, so let's move to the next uh, page. Then. And so you all have got a copy of the um, of the uh, of the questionnaire. And so in this questionnaire, what is important to note is that. So the very first question is if the project is uh, if the listed project is an eligible activity. So there is a criteria um, that federal highway administration lists um, about what is an eligible activity, and it is also included in our overall project um, project definition and, and description of what it is. So um, if the project is directly eligible under that criteria, and so this is more like a screening question. So I think this will simply have yes or no without any points associated with it. And the next question is that if it is an eligible activity, then how much um, does it expect to reduce emission? So there are these emission calculators that any applicant can use to figure out whether their project will reduce um, emission in terms of measured in terms of kilograms per tonnage um, per pound of carbon dioxide. Um, and we are thinking that um, that's going to be a narrative in the narrative form, and based on the level of attack, can decide whether it ranks zero, meaning it will take no um, production at all, ten meaning some maximum amount that is possibly that is possible. Then. And so you all will be making a decision based on the responses whether it's within a scale of zero to ten. The next question will be: Does the project um, address various equity criteria? So the equity criteria. Effectively means the area of persistent quality map is available. You can download them and work with the project scope is in terms of geography. You can figure out how many disadvantages groups um, are affected by self detect. Now, we are leaving it somewhat open ended uh, instead of making it you know, in terms of some numerical based, as in somebody could argue that this, this is the percentage of people who are below the poverty line within the project area. Instead, we're leaving it so that you can use the definition of equity um, in terms of um, not only the area of persistent property and low income, but also in terms of language, in terms of mobility. Um, because uh, the project you might be proposing maybe disproportionately benefits people with wheelchair. That's another equity criteria that comes up really importantly. And so we are, instead of defining equity very specifically so that we can quantitatively measure it, we're leaving it to the applicant itself to use their definition and tag them and evaluate their um, responses to it. The next question is how will the project benefit future generations at all? Many times in equity and situations, especially, we do not um, consider how is it going to affect the future generation. This comes up a lot in electric vehicles or any kind of carbon reduction program because whatever carbon reduction we, um, we achieve today, more than likely, it's going to be affect the future generations a lot more than it's going to affect um, you and I today. And so it's really important that we do pay attention to or articulate and start thinking about how will the project we're considering is going to affect the future generation. That again, I think, is uh, something subjective that I can evaluate and assign points to the ten. The next one is, does it consider surrounding community? Meaning that there are some brilliant ideas, uh, but if the Ideas are not connected or rooted into the community itself. Uh, they often do not succeed, and they often have towards uh, success rate. And so, the part of the application we're considering that uh, the applicant must think through: How does this project actually fit into the location and the surrounding area? And again, we think that zero to ten point would be good. Um, we also thought that there is the twenty percent is the minimum uh, match that is needed, and so we thought that. We don't think anybody would be proposing more than 70% match <laughs> on this. And so we figured that the way we could um, rate the contribution as at 20% match, that's the minimum, the zero point, and for each additional 5% point, the 5% um, is local match, the points keep going up to 10. And the last one is the what is the readiness level of the proposed project? And this is where I think. Um, Experience in the text of this deck would be very helpful because how we understand readiness of the project. Um, so, the way we wrote this down here, and we can modify it, of course, is that we broke it down into design, engineering, right of reacquisition, utility, relocation, and cost estimates. And the way each of them could be evaluated is that on each of those five criteria, if there is nothing written or is unsatisfied, it gets a zero point. If it partially addresses, it gets a one point. And if it fully satisfied, it gets a two point. Um, 
we were considering if the environmental review should be included into the discussion, but for the size of this project, we were thinking that that might actually be either included in the design or engineering or maybe simply not be applicable. So that's why we um, left that was that. And so this is how we are considering uh, uh, how this uh, questionnaire is going to look like when we are applying. And so we are open for discussion, suggestion, thoughts. Uh, okay, I have I had a few thoughts while you were talking there. Um, so, if, if y'all have that the hand out there, the carbon reduction program. One of the things I've stressed is that it's going to be over the next five years. So I would assume twenty twenty three to twenty twenty eight and twenty twenty two twenty twenty two twenty twenty seven. Yeah, but the money can go to get it out. And then it's almost 550000 half a million dollars each year for every year. And uh, like, like I just said, it's going to be allocated not through the FHWA, the textile to the MPO, it's going straight to the MPO. But the little one fire is a little bit, sorry about that. Um, so no, TechStop will still be uh, dispersing the payment. The way it is going to work, end up working in a reimbursement basis. And so once we select the project, modify our tip, and we will still send it to TechStop um, for their final list because they have to also include it into their estimate in order for these funds to be uh, allocated. So they'll have to do a modification as well. And so TechStart, we are still waiting for the guidelines from TechStart about the timeline of when would they be expecting it. But um, the guidance we received from our um, state and federal government, we can start the process and start trying to figure out the projects right now. And as we develop it, um, it, it should be, it should be, ought to be um, shovel ready with our projects. And so, so it will work on a reimbursement basis and the tech stock is the entity. So Federal Highway never sends the money directly to the MPO. It all, they always go through the state DOT. So in this case also, it will be through state DOT, but MPO will manage the entire process and send the project to tech stock, and then the reimbursement will be, will be processed by the MPO. Okay, uh, they also stress that the uh, projects need to be low cost, high impact projects. So when I read that, I think cost benefit analysis. And it's supposed to reduce the transportation emissions while benefiting communities. But yet there's again, in addition, there's a 20% local match funding at the minimum. So if we're getting 500, half a million dollars a year, 20% of that's got to come up with but local. So keep that in mind. That's why I think they want to, they should have really emphasized the uh, low cost, high impact part. Because sometimes 20% is hard to come up with. Um, so TxDOT and some cities have average daily traffic numbers for their roads, maybe not all the roads in their area, but uh, for some of their roads. And as you can imagine, more traffic means higher car emissions. So that might be a way for uh, a priority list of roads that would have the highest vehicle emissions. And then you also have to think, can think about bus routes, stuff like that, because buses and uh, 18 wheelers put off a lot of on emissions. And then also think, when it said holistically thinking, um, what came to my mind was the long queues of moms and dads waiting on their kids to get out of school. So they're all sitting there with their cars running. They got about two miles of cars waiting for kids to get school. So you have those areas. That's when we're putting a lot of emissions. Then another way to think about it is sidewalks. Because if you just walk, you're not driving. So that's cutting down emissions. And so sidewalks really be a low cost, high impact potentially uh, for bike routes. And then uh, cut throughs versus detours, sometimes there's a long way, you have to go a long ways to get from point A to point B. And that's just the way it is because it's not a direct route where what I'm gonna call uh, destination centers, could be like a mall or an HEB or a school or a hospital. That's where people go often, but they have to go a long way around because there's not a direct route through. 
if you had a direct uh, route through to the destination center, uh, then that would reduce emissions as well. Um, and then another thing I thought of is that you would need, I don't know if this would have, would, have, would count, uh, be eligible, be an eligible activity, but we could take uh, air testing at different areas around the, the county to determine, you know, ranking of who has the highest level of emissions, you know, whether that's the mall, whether that's I-35, whether that's a school queuing lane, whatever. Um, and then the other thing, uh, just remember, it's, uh, there's a 20% local match. So if, if uh, your city is a smaller city, um, but if there's a way for multiple cities to get together, if, it, if the benefit in multiple cities, then you'd at least have multiple cities helping pay part of that local match. Food for thought. Are entities allowed to reapply multiple times for different projects? Yes. Does that need to be included in this form anywhere? Like if they're approved and they can wait a project or anything like that? Um, each year we'll do a new project. Okay. Yeah. And so any big city does not disqualify anyone for this. Even if so we were like awarded it in year one, you haven't completed that project, you can still apply in year two? Um, that's what we are going to develop with the project tracking. Okay. To make sure that the way the project proposal uh, was negotiated is that there is a timeline and you know, the project tracking basically track for the timeline. And will like quarterly reporting requirements or anything on the project yes. be required? Yes. Okay. Just curious. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is the sex I got any money yet? Is this project funded? Do we have the first five hundred fifty thousand dollars of year one? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's already available um, in the current year. It is can twenty percent match the impact services? Um the the quick answer is yes. Because um, the federal guideline, there is a federal guideline about, um, about what is considered in kind of this stuff. So in kind, and for most of the, unless explicitly written, uh, federal rules require that we simply satisfy that. Uh, but one of the things that we figured that was important was that $550,000, just to put that in perspective, it's roughly cost of about half a mile of the sidewalk. That's all that money is. And that's the, one of the reasons behind why we decided to actually assign point by level of contribution. And so the cities that um, with a really high priority project, they want this fund, uh, they might be good. One other point, um, just rounding up to 550,000 per year, 20% of that's 110,000. So if you want to know what your 20% you're going to have to come up with, roughly, if it was the full amount, be 110,000. There is no such thing. And that's the reason why we're looking for projects. So if the projects evaluate much better, on, um, so we'll just go through the ranking. Uh, but the idea is that the whole top would go to one project? No. It, it could go to one project or it could be split up amongst multiple projects. So then that gives the 20%. Oh, but you're saying like it would fit to the whole top, whether it comes from one city. Right. If, if we had one project that took the whole 550000 then that whoever, what if that was one city, they need to come up with 110000 But let's say that's five projects at $100,000 each, when each, whoever's pushing each one, He's come up roughly twenty thousand dollars. Do you have a minimum um, score? Like, say you only have two people apply. Do you have a minimum score that you're going to require to allocate it out, or does the number one person make it? That's a good point. <laughs> so what? So what we're talking about right now is we 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 have a draft form that allows one to prioritize these projects, and that's why we're having this discussion because. Good point. You need to modify our form, most likely. 
Um, and then once this form gets approved, then I would assume this group would then discuss all the projects that get recommended, submitted, submitted and gets on a list. And then this group would have to prioritize it by the point system that's on that form. So it really emphasizes the stages here. And any talk on um, you know what the means of the score might have to be. I'm just is curious, just like the same we do like an RFP or something for some type of service, and we have one person who apply. I mean, yes, it's not the minimum standard, but it, I mean, it's just a what if nobody completes your entire application to the full yep. you know minimum yes. score? And what are you going to do then? Well, then the money gets rolled over to the next year. And we'll That's a good question. That's a good point. If the money does roll over. Yes. So we don't spend the first 550 the first year. The next year, we have a million. Yes. But we will start losing the money after. That. So if money is not allocated within three years, we start losing. Once it's allocated within the three years, how soon does it have to be spent? Um, I, are, is that, well, um, I was going to say, are you allowing withdrawals like before the project's complete? Like, are you allowing like midway point draws? No, this, uh, or is it only completed projects? Because if that's the case, you can allow that and pull your money before it starts. Going yes. away. So, again, I mean, that's something in which we do need your help with because um, our initial thought is that since we are going to be relatively small projects, it's not a lot of money we're talking about. So, on these small projects, we ought to be thinking more about. Competition and then the, the reimbursement. You know, so eighty percent of the cost, maximum of eighty percent. So keep in mind in the back of your mind, if you only have one applicant that gets approved that year and there's some whole amount, that's a big problem. I mean, it's not big to us per se, but it's big to some of these communities. Sure. So if they aren't able to complete it within one year, are you going to allow a draw in the mid period so they can go ahead and collect that reimbursement, or? Are you going to require a completed project if it's the whole reimbursement? So, 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 in some ways, um, that particular budgetary analysis can be done after the evaluation, meaning that once the uh, once the tax submits the prioritized list of project to policy board and the policy board um, makes a decision on the other projects we need to be submitted, and we start doing all the background work on the MTP and the chip development and send this forward to TechStop. We can at that point in time negotiate and they will have to do a contract uh, at that point in time. And keep in mind the, the tax is because we're just going to rep, we're going to suggest the projects to the policy board. Policy board makes the final decision. And then once they make that decision, then we'll have to and, and get to the minutia in the weeds. Yeah, well, I would also say that in some ways we are, we are waiting for, so Federal Highway Administration has given the guidelines it needs to give, but TxDOT has not. So TxDOT is still yeah, working on the sense. guidelines that, um, that they will be submitted. And I don't have a timeline on when should, I, should we be expecting from TxDOT. So some of the question about um, the reimbursement in midpoint or quarterly basis um, might get answered through the TxDOT guideline. Um, but if it is not, then that is something that we'll have to decide. Good point. It's a good question. Yes. Um, is there, uh, I just want to put out there. I wonder um, if it would be valuable to have some sort of recommendation to create like alignment or so with stakeholders, if that makes sense. Uh, so, like, you know, let's say, for instance, I might see something, but I'm like, aha, this would really need to be fixed. Because in theory, I think it's going to be quite a but actually, yeah, we would rather have those. Um, do you think it's valuable to have some kind of like alignment test in there or any sort of baseline data or any baseline proof of concept or proof of choice and just start in the business what you would call it product market market fit, right? Like, yeah, this is not just something that uh, a few people think that we are able to actually have some sort of baseline proof to know that this could actually end. Achieve what we achieve, and actually, you know, not just achieving the like reduced CO2, but also like those other goals, like making like improving the ability. I would probably say submit because all you can hear is no, but submit, and then we go through the, the form and the list and see if it's eligible, see if it's not eligible. If it is, then we keep going on. Well, is there a great desire for that, that project? Would that entity be able to come up to 
I mean, you start going through the. the so at some point, there'll be like a sort of like a litmus test because I've just seen a lot of like really pretty projects that nobody uses. Or yeah. like, you know, and so these have to have a time or where this is the first idea, but it doesn't actually like align with what that type of project is. Um, so I was just thinking, like, if, would it be valuable in some sort of way for whoever is filling this out to, to have to test the, the fitness of their project? I think all we have is the criteria that the that page or the uh, that we've been provided. Yeah, well, so you know that's certainly a good idea. Uh, we do have to consider though that do we make it so cumbersome because we have to remember that we have um, a lot of very small those companies too. And so if we make it really difficult for people to fill out, what I'm realizing is that even with um, some of the larger grants, a lot of cities simply do not apply because it is too much work. And so one of the I, one of the important considerations we try to keep in mind is that don't make it too complicated. Yeah, no, I agree so, with that. I'm just thinking even so, I think we could make it simple though, like has there been any qualification done? Has there been any kind of like did you survey a hundred parents about this, you know? What the likelihood would be of using like bikes or something to pick up kids if there were if there was safe infrastructure, something like, like any kind of like basic. So, test. so to answer your question, no, there's not a basic test. But I would think whoever was going to recommend a certain project be put on the list, it's a, incumbent upon them to do whatever testing they think necessary. I think well, it's a whole line that this has any quantitative or qualitative data that you want to provide sure. for backup documentation. Yeah, you support data. That. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would just recommend that to be really important because I think down the line, that's probably, that's just so much that you're not wasting money. Like, if they don't have it before it's submitted, I think that's something that should definitely be encouraged and try to, as part of that process with like the design, utility, engineering, I think some kind of publication or, or some kind of user research would be really valuable just to make sure like this money that we're investing is actually going to align with what we need to do. Who do you see at the city that's sort of spearheading this application? So in most cases, I would anticipate this to come out of public works planning. Mm -hmm. um, actually, transit is uh, directly eligible. So any project related to transit is actually directly eligible project under the public works program. And so it's listed as one of the prominent ones mm -hmm. um, um, up front. Um, so, so those are the two units. Um, however, in this particular case, I would think that if a parks department wanted to do a, you know, just turn the current sidewalks with trees, right there, you know, even that makes sense. You know, so in that sense, parks department would be another one that comes up. Um, but there wouldn't necessarily be a requirement of community engagement. It's like somebody in parks department thinks this is a good idea. I'm going to apply for this. Even though we've got, you know, this bike and pedestrian group that has all kinds of ideas, how does that interplay? Like, how how is uh, their opinions going to make their way to the person applying for the parks department? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And in fact, one of the things we noticed when we sent out this information to everybody, um, the bike network group and, and stakeholders, that. Um, we thought that it would be important for, because so if you're going to modify or do anything, the right of way is going to be important. And so the entity that is applying needs to have, at the very minimum, either own the right of way or have some arrangement with the right of way for whoever has the right of way. And so if, um, and we figured that, you know, if you're a small, let's say if you're a neighborhood group with a really great idea um, that you want something done, well, the neighborhood group is, and let's suppose we're talking about a text doc right of way. The neighborhood group is going to have a really difficult time navigating the entire process of well, how do we even initiate the discussion with text doc? But if it happens to be in City of Waco, then City of Waco already has uh, made a little of work together. And so it makes more sense for the community group to simply approach the, the planning department or the public works or parks department who can then disappear and um, that um, that that's what I would be doing. And keep in mind, like that um, item seven there. Uh, what is the readiness level of the proposed project? I mean, you have 
it may be a great idea, but that idea has to incorporate the engineering design, like you talked about the right of way acquisition. You got to buy a right of way if it's a new road or uh, a wider road, or if you want a sidewalk, but you have no right of way, then you need to buy a right of way to put your sidewalk. Utility relocations, there's utilities underground, above ground. Uh, all those are costs that will eat into the, the amount of money that you thought you had. So, and in most cases, uh, the money is just not enough to actually acquire right of ways or for you to believe it. Those are typically very expensive projects. And so, we're really hoping that the project ideas that come out with this are often the ones that do not require a lot of that. Low cost, high impact. <laughs> <laughs> All right, does anybody else have any uh, uh, questions before we move on to the next item? Okay, good discussion. Uh, so do we need, uh, uh, we need an actual, we need a quote? Yeah, and so I, uh, um, so the, 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 the thing that I would love to share with the policy board that the TAC is ready to uh, help with um, evaluating and receiving the policy proposal. Um, and so if that's what we need to um, So we don't, we're not actually voting on this actual form, we're voting on just the process, overall overall process to help uh, create a process to receive ideas, to evaluate them, prioritize them, and then to have a process to recommend back to the policy board for their ultimate approval. And a lot of questions that just came up, uh, we will incorporate, try to incorporate them either in the description of the project itself or for each of the questions, the descriptions listed there. And so we'll try to, um, so for instance, connect it to a concept or something, or so, uh, I'm sure that at the minimum, we can add some sentences in the description of each of the questions where uh, we can encourage people to try to get across I was going to ask, could you go back on the slides? If we're, I think we're at 60 points total. Yes. Roughly. Um, could we, I know a lot of applications have just that kind of a generic sort of, does the application demonstrate community support? And it's giving points if they have letters of recommendation from just for that. If we just add something like that to it and, and give it, you know, points that they have, letters of support from the chamber or the bike path folks or, you know, the, let your vehicle flow or something like that. And that way it's it's in the process. I think it's a great suggestion. And it does, it, it sends a message to the applicants too that hey, you get some points, maybe not 10, but would you do it? And and I would also add to that, I mean, I didn't do the math real quick. 60 points, I mean, it'd be nice to was nice around 100 points. <laughs> I mean, then you could. It's easier to buy by tens. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, we were uh, we were trying to uh, figure out if we want to uh, emphasize one question a little more. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So now for the um, community engagement, I think we have that become seventy points. Let's say so then we have eight <laughs> questions. Do we just want to try to figure out from two, two, two more, more, two more, two more, two more, and then you can. Uh, I mean, we could. It just that uh, 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 we do have to weigh this. To, we don't want to. But but that's what we'll we we'll work on if the policy board approves this idea, this concept, right? Sure. So what we're here to do today is just to vote to uh, recommend to the policy board to adopt this pro carbon reduction program project evaluation process. And the process can be modified. So moves. <laughs> Thank you, Mitch. I'll have a second. I'll second it. Uh, any other discussion? All right. All in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? All right. It's the next we pass. Okay. So that's done. We're going on to item agenda item number three. Update and discussion regarding. Reconnecting communities grant application and local match. We can you so, um, so we talked about this um, grant very briefly at one point in time, and at that time we had mentioned that 
um, if we, if each of the communities already have some projects in mind that they could uh, move forward with it. As time has gone on, what became clear to me was that um, it's really difficult for any city to actually have any project that they could very quickly submit to the Sweet Connecting Committee because the requirements are, 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 I would say again, we have to judge you know, how much effort any city is going to make in making the application are they ready and what the uh, chances of uh, success are. And so, um, so we decided that um, we need to probably write a planning grant proposal rather than the implementation grant. That's what the city uh, And this would be similar to the safety action plan in which we will do the planning first and develop several projects and then expect each of the cities to take those projects and then apply for implementation. And we need to do the same thing for the connecting communities. Um, we made this decision um, after talking to a few cities who I was hoping that they would be applying for some implementation grants, but then I came to realize that um, it's nearly impossible for them to actually do it because we simply do not have the project that are at the design engineering phase whereby they could demonstrate um, that there have been community support, there have been community engagement, um, because those are the items that federal higher administration expects that are already completed by the cities before they can apply for it and realize that we simply do not have them. And so at the MPO um, last week, after that discussion, we figured that you know, uh, we might have go ahead and start a planning uh, grant process so that as we develop the plan, we satisfy that requirement for most of the cities um, based on certain amount of projects. And so what we, um, so this is what it is. This is also part of the um, bill by Pricing Infrastructure Law. And it funds both planning and capital construction. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we we're expecting some capital construction project to be submitted from cities, but we did not see them. So we're going to go ahead and apply for the planning grant. And uh, it is designed to reconnect communities by removing barriers to community activity. And it is expected to improve mobility access to economic development. The total allocation is one billion over five years. Um, and just to give a little bit of background again, one billion over five years for this grant is really not a lot of money. A billion sounds like a lot, but it's um, 200 million each year over the next five years, and that's for the whole country. And so it's again, it's not a lot of money, and so it is going to be somewhat competitive. And that's why we figured that it was important that we do the planning and flesh out the projects and get the, all the projects ready so that whoever these projects might be, the respective cities can go and apply for this. Application deadline is October 13th. Um, I was, uh, I, since we started working on this grant only last week, and so we have a full draft done that we are reviewing, so we'll submit it in time. So, so we'll do that, um, but here is what we're doing. Um, I wanted to update you, and again, also get some of the thoughts. Um, we figured that um, reconnecting community grant basically came up with, so some of you are probably familiar that Rochester has a loop that I don't recall the exact number. Um, and it was a sunken loop, so the highway went underneath and cut through a community and, and killed the community many years ago when it was built. And City of Rochester had been working on that project for quite some time. It's one of the marquee projects that's got a lot of press in which the, the loop was filled in and now it has high density mixed income, mixed use development on top of it. Well, we figured that, um, yes, that sounds, um, wonderful except that we're not convinced if if half a billion dollar project is worth here in Westland County that we can come up with something like that. And besides in our internal discussion what we have also come to realize is that communities don't get destroyed because of a single marquee project. You know it's often a series of investment we make over time with no attention to the community that we end up with situations like one of the ones that jumped out of us very clearly was um, the triangle in Belmont, for instance, in which I-35, 84, and is that like 340 or 340, right? 340. It creates a triangle which has two grocery stores, Walmart and HEB. It has dentist office, uh, schools, a high school and elementary school, train tracks on one side, bond, bond field. It is completely disconnected from everything else. Now, the, now, one could come up with a $2 billion project to move all of the highways away, but that makes no sense because the amount of disruption it will cause will probably be, go into tens of billions. 
And so instead of thinking that way, we really ought to be thinking about how do we connect that community and that level of businesses to low cost projects through sidewalks, um, forest highways, um, you know, overpass and if we need to make them. And so that's how we decided to write this. That's the approach we took. It is a little bit involved. We have to define exactly how are we doing this. And so we spent a lot of time researching some of the areas um, not only how the Washington Avenue Bridge at one point in time was really the only connector that existed on, on the two sides of the river and how it has played out over time. And we argued that most of our transportation infrastructure in McLean County, we actually have a somewhat complicated relationship. With. You know, um, they, are, they are vital, they're extremely important. We can't live without them. But at the same time, our relationships are not straightforward as we would bad or we should you know, immediately remove them or not remove them, we really need to be thinking through about creative ways of connecting the community back together. And so that's what we're defining by saying that, you know, it's a cuts of thousand inequities and we are trying to stitch the communities back together. That's the approach we have decided to take for that. And so any feedback is important here. And so the way we're describing it is that how the minority communities have been disconnected over time. We discovered several different neighborhoods which um, which have, in fact, right now the uh, traffic circle, there was the White City, uh, which had a significant Hispanic neighborhood that's completely gone. There was Wesley High School. It was one of the most important high schools in Waco at some at one point in time. Actually, it was called University High School because it gave them maybe a fee for college because the campus of that high school um, gave all the students uh, an understanding of what did it feel like to be in a college. And that's gone. And so there have been you know, some of those kinds of disruptions. Um, but what we're seeing today is quite often students don't have access to the schools on sidewalks when you um, or, or health centers or grocery stores. Um, another classic example actually is the HEV near, near Valley Mills and near traffic circle. So in spite of being close to the HEV, the area between the Salt Avenue and the Wooden Apprentice. Yeah, primrose. Uh, primrose. Um, that area is a, is a food desert, and which makes absolutely no sense. You have an HEV grocery store right across the highway, but a large swath of it is a food desert. And so, again, we need to be thinking creatively about how do we connect these. City of Waco has already put bike lanes on Primrose, but they just a little bit of um, area left between 77 and the HEV underneath the highway, which if we could um, you know, figure out what is the best way to design that project as part of this money. And that, uh, that's, our, that's how we're approaching about why, instead of trying to identify a single marquee project, we should really be thinking creatively about how can we create a series of smaller projects that will allow us to apply and get funded and be able to bring them together. So, um, so our next step really is that we'll submit it. Uh, our, our internal deadline is Tuesday. So by Tuesday, we'll have the uh, grant submitted. And if we uh, are successful, then uh, the timeline on this is the Federal High Administration will make their decision, their selection by sometime by March or April, actually April. And so after April, we'll know what happens. And once we do that, we'll have a citizen steering committee that will drive most of this, because this is one of the areas where I have come to not only uh, now, I've been in Waco for um, less than a year now, and uh, and in spite of having gone through a lot of these archival material and such, the reality is that I don't, I barely know, uh, you know, what communities have gone through and they are. And so it is really important that for each of the project that we discuss, we have a steering committee that helps us not only guide it, but then organizing the public meetings and identifying the project, the detailed scope of the project, what should it look like, and so not just the, so a lot of us sitting here in this room have a lot of technical expertise, uh, but we don't live in a lot of those communities. And so it is really important that we do that. And then after we have this, uh, after we complete it, then our expectation is that we have a fully fleshed out shovel-ready project that each of the city can, um, can, can in fact take the project and submit it and be able then, and we would like to help. And so that's one of the reasons why we also look, uh, we are planning to write in certain amount of budgets so that we can, us, we can assign some amount of help to all the municipalities in our know, planning area in actually writing some of these grants. And so that's the update. That's where we are. And any question, comment, suggestion, yeah, we have not submitted it. We are finalizing our narrative. Um, we'll be happy to um, take. 
So will a copy of your submission be available for others to look at? Um, you would have one screen. Uh, I'll be happy to share. Okay. Uh, thank you for that update. Let's move on to item number four. Update and discussion regarding the creation of a local fund to meet local match requirements for grant recipients. Yeah, so this is the portion um, which we started discussing at the last meeting related to safety action grant, uh, safety action grant, and this is going to have a uh, bearing event on this week connecting communities grant because this is also something that will require a 20% local match if we get the, uh, get the fund. Um, I'm again applying for 700,000, which will mean 560,000 from the federal government and $140,000 local match. And again, significant portion of it I'm expecting will occur through um, in-kind donation because a lot of steering group work and all the city that are going to be working on, a lot of that is, 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 is eligible um, in-kind match. But it is required, but we do know that we have an 80-20 split that we need this project as well. And so at the last policy board meeting, um, we had a preliminary discussion of the tax, but at the last policy board meeting, we had fleshed out some more detail about what might a local fund look like and the kind of contribution that we'd be expecting. And so um, the way we did this, um, the example was that the budget was 560 and 140, and about half of local share is what, um, in my estimate, will be the in kind, and the remainder will have to be covered through local match. And we were, we had mentioned the TAC members could have a conversation between their jurisdictions. And so the way we uh, broke it down was that we have 20 voting members on our uh, policy board, um, including one from TxDOT and three from smaller cities. So excluding them, we actually have 16 voting members among which we could um, allocate these funds. And the way we were considering doing that is um, with this central city Waco um, at 50,000, half of that local fund. The smaller cities and maternal county together at about 26%, and all the other cities uh, that are above 5,000 in population at about $4,000 each. And that will add up to roughly about $100,000. That's what we presented to the policy board of their consideration at the last. <laughs> And the way we came up with is this chart that you can see how we, we broke down uh, the population of each of the city. Every city that is listed there um, are the ones who we expect that they ought to be responsible for portions of the funds. And so based on that, you know, total match um, we need is 140. In-kind will end up being somewhere between 40 to 70,000 and the cash match 100,000. And going back to that, the 50% from City of Waco, 26% from Atlanta County, also representing small cities, and 24% from um, six other cities that we have. And so the six other cities we have in mind are Woodway, Hewitt, Lacey Lakeview, um, Delmead, McGregor. What, am I missing one more? Oh, six. <laughs> And so that's where we are. Any thoughts, suggestions, comments? What I'm hoping to do is that once we create such a local fund, and again, I've had some conversations with the finance people in the city of Waco Finance Division that they're already familiar with how we manage some of this. And so we have the infrastructure ready for that. We just have to um, agree to move forward like this. And once we do that, we ought to be able to tap into a significant amount of more grants then. And for what it's worth, uh, it's not new um, just for us here. In fact, majority of the cities, especially smaller cities, when it comes to large um, grants, they often find the idea that we spend so much money on design engineering, hire consultants to do all the work. Unless there is a really good probability of success at getting the funds, it's really hard to allocate some of those funds. We are hoping to alleviate some of those challenges uh, with this process. Any thought, comment, question, suggestion that you might have, you're all ears. Part of like the way you had that broken down, the smaller cities, uh, greater than 5,000, where they <coughs> basically have to come up with $4,000. Um, 
I think that's an achievable amount, even with their limited resources. So, I know we had a person here from Lacey Lakeview and can't speak for their city council, but would you agree that 4,000 out of place of the budget would be found or at least budgeted for? Possibly yes. We'll probably build. I know uh, this fiscal year got through with that budget. I have to check from different forms. Do you have a time frame for this? Um, so the first requirement would be the safety action plan, and I'm expecting to hear back. Um, well, then, like, then to compile the funds or, you know, allocate the funds based on a quarterly basis or anything like that. Roughly about uh, March or April. That's the time frame. I'll tell you, why can we do the Instead of raising our water rate for us, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Water's in short supply. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Kish. Um, I'm just a little bit overwhelmed with like the amount of grant. So I'm sorry, Kristen. Can you just give like a breakdown of like how this is different? What, what are we? Is this just like a WACO grant? This is not like a state or a grant? I'm going to get that. That, that, can you go back to that other slide you just talked See the SS4A, so that's safe streets for all, okay. right? Yes. And so that's that's how it's different versus the uh, carbon reduction and versus the uh, community reconnecting community grant. And so going back to why it would be good for the MPO staff to be under the policy board, which the policy board would be uh, the MPO which could then hire more staff, meaning to hire somebody to be writing grants. As you see, there's a lot of grants, a lot of money available. They have three people. I mean, and they do a lot of other work. So they need somebody to kind of be working on grants and bird dog and that. And then and we're just writing the grant. You have quarterly reports, you have annual reports. It's all funding games after that. Yeah. So there's a lot of work. Well, a few people do it. Well, so what is so I you were supposed to ask because so this is where this is for a long term. Is it your vision as part of the MPO that all of the member cities maybe annually would contribute to the fund and, and there would be a number, let's say half a million dollars or something, and then the same percentage would apply to that. So that funds creates a fund at the MPO yes. for the board to use. So this would be kind of an annual long deal, not just specifically to each grant. Yes. There'd just be a budget and you would decide or the board would decide how to allocate. Exactly. Okay. So um, so so the way we presented it to the board last time was that the board can restrict the grants only to be used for specific purposes. So they could say that this, this money can only be used to come up with local natural instance. And the idea is that hundred thousand uh, seemed like a reasonably achievable number each year. And so that, and, and I can take the local fund and local, local fund and also do some fundraising. So that's some of the other non-governmental entities who contribute to it as well. And that way, that will allow us to allow us the capacity to not only help with. Right now, what is happening in the, the reconnecting community grant, our initial discussion was that, well, let's back off from the planning grant. And there are so many projects we can come up with that, you can, that, that simply have the city apply for the reconnecting community grant. But then once we start looking into the actual writing of the grant, it turns out that there are expectations which we can't meet at this point in time. So that probabilistically, it's just not uh, realistic for us to spend so much resources to apply for the grant and not get it. And so, um, so what we're expecting is that over the next five to six years, which we keep emphasizing that we are, this opportunity is not going to occur to us again. Uh, for a very long time. So we ought to be able to uh, tap into these resources to the best of our ability. And so having a local um, fund in that sense would go a long way in terms of, because I also have to make a decision. I mean, do I really want to allocate our own resources to apply for that when I have no um, confidence that I'll be able to come up with it? Okay. And I, I would add to that, that this idea of all of the cities, all the members of the MPO, Kicking in a little bit to a local pot 
that we could use somehow, whether it's on grants or some project. That was an idea that was born from the strategic planning work group that, um, that you know, is part of this big document that we all just uh, voted to submit to the policy board for their consideration and approval. Um, and then secondly, what one of y'all do were mentioning about community involvement in case you talked about partnering, if we had a fund, a pot of fund, a pot of money that the MPO, you know, all the entities kick in money and then uh, the MPO has authority over that money. Let's say that on the reconnecting idea, HEB says, if we can only reconnect to that community over there, we think you come shop at our HEB, we would be willing to match dollar for dollar or 50 cents on the dollar or something on this project. And so MPO has some money, HEB kicks in some money, and maybe there's somebody else, uh, economic development branch, somebody, and pretty soon now we have enough money to make the project happen. That would be the part ID. Okay. So we're ready to, that's number four. Are we ready to move on to number five? We don't have anything on this yet. So we keep tabling it until we uh, get the uh, targets set for the next time. Um, the only update I have about the electric vehicle infrastructure plan really is that uh, the textile Navy infrastructure plan was approved by federal high administration toward the end of September. And so it's all done. Now the next step really is that we're waiting for TxDOT, um, uh, TxDOT to finalize its instructions for how will the MPOs be involved in project solicitation and evaluation for the location of the next phase of implementation. And we are expecting that by 15th of November, that's the thing that, um, that TxDOT is working on at this point in time. And so, um, what, so we have gone through some of this. Texas is going to have uh, $407 million over 2022-2026. And, uh, and most of that money, again, is going to be 80% federal and 20% local. And when we say 20% local, in this case, it actually means 20% private. Uh, so we are expecting the private applicants to apply for opening charging stations and be able to cover 20%. We know that this program is also going to work on a reimbursement basis. And so, in, so the initial cost of opening a charging station will be borne by the applicant, which in this case is expected to be private um, applicant, not local government. And then they get to be first in the next one for that. Um, and I think some of them have had already applied for it and have already been approved for it. Uh, but, but, but this $407 million, that has not been released yet. So that's the one we are waiting for. And I am not, that's a good question. If somebody who did not receive funding earlier, can they qualify under the next round or not? I, 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 I'm, I'm going to take note of it. And next time we have a discussion, we'll, we'll pick that up. Um, these are the existing uh, charging stations that most of you are already familiar with. Uh, the potential fast charge stations um, are there listed as well, the Walmart and I-35. This is part of the 60, is it, um, Eric, is that 60 mile or distance on the, on the highway corridors? 50 mile. 50 mile. Um, so that's already in the Levy plan, so that is going to be funded. But along with that, in McLennan County, especially on a lot of highways, our 35 is going to get covered nicely no matter what. That's not our concern. Our concern ought to be Route 6 and 31 and 84 and all these different major groups that exist. And so those are the areas we will be focusing on as um, in the next one. I have a question on that previous slide. You, you, you kind of call out that 22 DC fast plugs for Tesla. Wouldn't, wouldn't they all be correct? Correct. Or, is there any so, so, so the test that I use is its own um, proprietary system. Yes, and um, and then there are these other ones, which I believe there are two major ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah, the, the level one and level two charging are AC, and there's actually a Tesla AC charging. Fastest charging ones on AC. 
and they're not exclusive to. So Tesla had a DC charger, but then there are other DC chargers which Chevy or Ford or they all use. And those, those are more kind of a standard C CSS standard Tesla's separate. But so, so you're like it's supposed to be converting there, so that other people can use them too. Can, can electric vehicles take either one DC or AC, or yeah. it's just one or the other? Well, uh, they can. Not all, especially older electric vehicles, can't do DC charging. Um, but you know, almost all of the new ones can do either DC or AC. So as we move forward, you know, I my understanding is that um, a lot of discussions that I've seen is that level one chargers are what basically plug in your garage right now on Monday or 20 volt and, and you get somewhere close to five to eight miles per hour um, charge. That's the worth of mine you get. But level two is much more popular for people that runs on 240 volt and you can get uh, about 10 times more per hour. On level two, which is usually sufficient for most um, private users, uh, but for freight and other types of, so as we start going there, DC charging is the only way we can have to handle those. It's the only way that we can, you know, be traveling long distance, make a stop, and within 20, 30 minutes, maybe even an hour, get charged up enough to go another two hundred miles. I, I, I did put at, at the Tesla uh, charging station near Collins Bakery. It was uh, one of the it's you charge enough for you to have uh, a croissant or something from the bakery and go back in the car and you're late and now you're off uh, Dallas. And actually, it turns out uh, quite a bit. It's about, um, you know, roughly about, what is it, about, about 10 some miles per minute or more than that? Yeah, it, it depends on the power level. They keep Building stations with higher amounts of power. So now, like the highest is typically like three So, yeah, I don't know if it's the station down here. But yeah, the, the best performing station is generally top 20 minutes. So, um, so that's where we are. We're waiting for on November 15th um, is the target date for receiving a lot of additional guidelines so that we can move forward to the next phase of implementation for the next four or five years. And so as it come along, comes along, I, I'm pretty sure Tark will be deeply involved in that process of making recommendations and directions. Text out with query project updates, sir. All right, uh, Winkle Drive AEA upgrade. We're continuing to install new signal components throughout the project. Uh, primary sidewalk work is what I'm going to call the west end of the job between Center Point and 30th Street. Uh, also, working on our, our culvert extension at Waco Creek in front of the, the bowling alley. Uh, we're on target for being complete late this calendar year or the next. 18th Street ADA. Uh, this is a project that's nearing completion here in Waco. Uh, we've completed the basket group sidewalk work. Uh, there's a little bit of cleanup and some signage going on. Uh, there's actually a small amount of this contract that's going on up in uh, the Aquila and Penelope area. Uh, that work will wrap up later this month as well. We're about that project. Uh, Spring Valley widening. Again, this is uh, turn lane addition, shoulders, and drainage improvements between Sun Valley and Cuba Drive. Creek's working on completing the detour pavement on the west side of the roadway. Actually, next week, we anticipate moving that traffic over onto that temporary pavement, which will allow us to start the permanent widening on the east side of the roadway. Along with this work, we're starting our widening of the bridge there, Castle and the Creek. We're working on widening Castle and the Creek. Uh, when we switch traffic, that's roughly a nine to 12 month traffic phase, but we anticipate a completion in the summer of 2024 on that job. State Highway 6, Mall to Mall, again, are uh, widening and front of road bridges between uh, US 84 and the interstate. The bulk of the work continues to be on the new front of road overpasses, uh, closest to Beverly Drive, uh, starting with the front of roads and returns, closest to the Imperial Crossing at 84. We anticipate opening the new bridges closest to Beverly later part of November, early December. Uh, that'll allow us to start work on the main lane bridges while we wrap up the front of the road. We're on target for a 
total completion date of twenty twenty three. So should have a about this time next year. Uh, the big project um, will be up here. I've got a breakdown of our, our milestones. We've kind of talked about it before, but our first major milestone was the completion of the southbound main lanes. And that was done in 381 days. The northbound main lanes will complete on August 10th. We're currently tracking towards our substantial completion milestone. We've charged 1,024 days out of our 1,150 allotted by contract. We're still on target for substantial completion data. This calendar year. So, here's just an aerial of the south end of the job. You can see the, the completed main line pavement, the front of roads, the southern tie in is pretty much in its wrap up phase. Here at 11 to 12, you can see the, the new pavement placed with the intersection. We're completing a lot of the flat work in the area with the riprap, a curb ramp, sidewalk, working on getting the permanent signals installed. Right now, we're working with Encore to get our power and electrical services set up in this intersection. Things go perfectly. We're probably looking late October, uh, but it's possible that that goes into November before that's fully opened up with, with the signals there. Here's the same intersection, just looking at the tie in on the east side of the interstate. And you can see some of that sidewalk work that's remaining. Uh, moving up to 4th Street. The majority of the fourth street side of the intersection has been completed on both the west and east sides. Uh, there's a lot of flat work in this area as well, getting permanent signals in place, working on some of the landscaping underneath the family bridges. Uh, here's the east tie in of fourth street to Dutton, there close to Baylor. And that's, that's continuing to, uh, to near its final stages of construction. Same area, just looking back to the south again at the tie in. Here's the this street area. This is where the bulk of the work that remains in this intersection. We've recently shifted traffic over to the south half of Fifth Street onto that new concrete pavement. Uh, we're working on the north half now, completing some drainage work. The pavement will be ongoing over the next couple of weeks. Later part of October, should have concrete pavement down in that Fifth Street and up to its, to its full width. Looking to the north from University Park to the Brazos River, and you can see there's a small leave out close to the Ranger Museum at the bottom of the page. That's been, uh, been completed since this photo was taken. The point is only two lanes there. Go to the next slide. There's also University Park's work. Um, on the east side, there's a little bit of tie in work to be done for the westbound lanes that was completed this week, actually. If we go to the next slide, so sorry, one more. Here's the right. here's the, the west side of University Parks. We're working on completing that time for new pavement to hold. A lot of the curb and gutter in place. Our paving crew should be in next week to get asphalt laid. In the later part of next week or the early part of the week after, we should be working on getting traffic opened up after the University Parks intersection. And just looking back to the Brazos River, you can see the completed front of road bridges here. This is just to the north of MLK, working on landscaping and flat work in this intersection. I put the bulk of the road right there. Uh, looking to the north from Forest Street towards Business 77, again, you can see the completed bank lanes with four lanes of stretch them. Looking back to the south from Forest towards the railroad. I hear your hear your business 77, and this intersection has changed completely from the beginning of the job. Remember the multi level interchange with direct connects. It's been brought down to Act Rage. You can see the main lanes of business 77 have been completed. We're working on the side street connections, Taylor Street, along with some of the other minor side streets. That's something that by the end of October, October, early November, should be near completion. Along with those side streets, we're working on flat work, sidewalks, curb ramps, permanent signals in this intersection as well. In same, same intersection. Here you can see the, the west tie in, the spots interchange. 
I'm looking to the north from business 77 towards 84. We do trip and shop in main lanes. Here, looking north at the 84 intersection. This intersection is, is for all intents and purposes. The pavement's complete here and in its final configuration. So traffic's operating at a much better level than it had been. So here you can just see the tie in to the east side. Sam's and HEB. And then looking towards our freight and cramp. There's your west side. Here at, at Barron Circle, it's completing our minor side street connection there at Wheeler. This is an intersection that's in its final configuration as well, all paved. Just a shot of the main lanes in there. West Tine and Baron Circle. Questions or comments on this piece of paper? Thank you, Clay. <laughs> Somewhere else. <laughs> All right. Well, with that. That's item number seven. Item number eight is work group updates. Uh, yeah, um, we didn't meet since the last meeting, but we did receive the uh, prior to that, the last meeting. And um, since the last meeting, we've been reviewing the carbon reduction plan and the criteria that were sent out uh, and gave our input. We really appreciate just uh, y'all letting us uh, be able to provide some input. And, uh, look at the criteria and give suggestions. Um, and we look forward to doing that in the future too with other projects that come up. Thank okay. you. Uh, so that's the Black and Pet uh, work group and the other three there, uh, Citizens Participation Work Group, Connected Automated Vehicles Work Group, and then the Ability Land Use and Transportation Work Group, not yet staffed, if you will. Okay. So then we'll move on to item number nine, MPO monthly report. We have an important one. Yeah, so I met with MPO staff a couple weeks ago about this. Uh, some feelers on what's going on. We currently, through business 77 between now 35 and loop 574, we're working on a preventative maintenance program. Maybe I'll drive that road, but the main lane pavement is in very poor condition. And so we are looking at replacing the main lane pavement to the tune of about $15 million with the new concrete pavement that will last 30 plus years. However, back in 2015, MPO did a study on Vista 77. I believe it was a late short drive, all the way to 574. And we looked at revamping Vista uh, 77. This section is specifically, right now, it's a freeway section. It's got main lanes, frontage roads, entrance, and exit ramps. But then it's bookended on either end by a boulevard section. So it's not really a haven as a freeway section. There's no bicycle pedestrian facilities out there right now. Um, but what I was getting at is this project was set to let in the summer. We're going to replace all that pavement. But at the same time, I don't want to put that kind of money, a $50 million project out there, if the MPO decides to go this route sometime in the future. Um, you mean boulevard? Right. So I'm gonna to have to do something no matter what. We're gonna to have to do if right the payments were a terrible we're gonna do something. So whether it's a band-aid project to buy us time to start development and looking at doing something like this, we can do that. Or if y'all choose, we, we can go just stick with the main project and leave it in the same configuration. What's the timeline that you have to when's the no go no go? I would like to know <laughs> today. <laughs> it doesn't require an action on it. It's it, this is just open discussion. I mean, if this is something I want to see, I can go report to the MPO, get this project in the MTP, we can get a, a schematic provider going on it. When the time comes to fund it, it's gonna have to go through the, the scoring and ranking process to, to try to get funded. Um, but at the same time, if, if we do that, then I'm gonna convert the project I'm working on now, like I said, to a band-aid type project for buys time to. To go through the schematic and the public involvement by the final process to do something like that. So, but basically, what this look what this looks at doing, I don't know where it's at, but 
On the right hand side, that's the, the railroad over there, the railroad bridge. Uh -huh. um, and it would take up Orchard Lane, turn it, convert it into a, to a roundabout, and then also with a three level interchange where Loop 474, or Square 474 comes in, that would come down to that grade also. And then it would probably also look at extending Loop 574 to where Knock River is and tying it just to the Square 474. I know this schematic is a little hard because if the top of the map is actually facing southwest. So brick, brick is on the, down at the bottom right. So you have to almost think like it's been upside down. Is that blue area, is that a flood plane? Is that why it's blue shaded there? No, uh, it's a hundred foot, hundred year foot line, but there are uh, businesses and stuff on the uh, or the, the east side. So, yeah, that's um, where the bridges are. That's why you have bridges to get by the water. Um, I thought it was just an artist concept. So oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Those pools are just an artist concept. It was a consultant drawing. Yeah, had someone come in and give us the study. I remember them doing this <laughs> and, and revising all this to a boulevard because it no longer needs to be a highway, we were told. But the, there's just no traffic. This is the old 77, I 35 of the places, and it's a light. This is no highway. So they, this, yeah. they provided this as no, our suggestion. I remember we recommended it at that time was we're going to convert this to a bad grade board. That's why they changed the after by intersection. It's, it's, it's bad grade. There's just not enough traffic for a highway. So they keep yeah. yeah, just to remind everybody, the policy board did accept this study and you know, recommended it. So they don't need more than that. They don't need us. We don't need the folks to give them more direction, but it's been a while since this has been talked about. So Victor just wants to make sure that we're all still on the same page. <laughs> and this is the direction that we want to go in. And like you said, our next step would be we're going to figure out for them what a stop, what the first step would be, and then us getting uh, it's an MTP, it's just not a project. So we have to figure out how to. Is is your band aid like mill overlay or is it full reconstruction? Or it, it, it would just be an overlay, pretty much. Overlay. Something armored up a little bit the last time. Yeah. Because if we do this, starting as a schematic phase, we're probably looking anywhere from four to six years to actually do the project. Right. Band aid. I love band aid. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it would make sense if you have a full bar section on each end. To make it boulevard all the way through. And then would that not help spur economic development on both sides? I think it would. That's that's a good thing. That'd be a benefit to the community. Have... Plus where it's at is a close to bike. Plus the people that that were involved in that, but there was a bunch of Baylor students who they're all gone now, I'm sure. But they were just saying that it sure would be nice to be able to ride to the brick. <laughs> and y'all remember that. No, from campus, no, bikes. So, um, so that was it. That's still a long ways off because we have to plan something to make its way, some of it could make its way into grant, some of the grants, if those are successful. <laughs> so, um, there's there's different ways to go about it, but he that Victor just wants to know, it, just to reiterate, do we want to move this direction? Because it's been a while. <laughs> we won't take a vote on this. We don't need a vote. We don't need a vote. I, I would say just, that's a good idea. And especially if anybody has some very serious um, objection to it, then we should consider it. If not, I think it would be true. Vote from it actually comes down to the executive's point. That's when we actually vote. So, based on this open discussion, I, I think it makes sense to pursue this. I think too. Okay, does that give you enough to get going? That's all I need. I've got a project manager ready to go. Okay. So, <laughs> wait. so, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I have one, one more. One more. One more item, too. So, 
that's when we were developing the fiscal year 23 UTP. That's our tech stock tenure plan document. I know I'm brief possible, but I don't think I'm brief with the technical committee on the next section of I 35 funding, or what we call section 4C, the one from 12th Street that goes to the south. So we, we have a set of plans that are pretty much ready to go. The right away has all been acquired. The utilities have been moved. It's a clean project. We did not the door. We were just pulled up on, on funding. And so back when we built the FY23 UTP, policy board did commit to funding 25% of it, about 67 million with CAT2 funds. And then TechStop, we, we put up uh, CAT4, what's called the statewide connectivity funds. We put up another 67 million, so we got to 50%. In hopes that the Texas Transportation Commission would fund the remaining 50% with their uh, discretionary what we call CAT 12 funds. So, with this UTD cycle, we did not get the CAT 12 funds, but they did award us what's called SWDA, that's statewide uh, development. So, we keep working on the project, keep, keep moving along, and then the next progression would be to get to the CAT 12 funds when we go through the FY24 UTD. And just based on the environment, I can't speak for the commission or what's going to happen. Or but in my opinion, I think we have a really good shot. It's looking really good. So again, I just want to kind of even update that this there's a good chance that this is going to start picking up speed and moving past me. So you know, it's, it's good news. We didn't get to catch up because it, it is good news to have the SDB. So all right. That is good news. Thank you for that. All right. Uh, well, with that, it's number nine, we're on number 10 announcements. Um, so this is the one that I wanted to make sure that um, everyone here paid attention to. Um, there is significant amount of funding available under the Highway Safety Improvement Program. This is a tech stock funded um, grant program, and all the scholars are eligible to apply for it. And I really hope that uh, at least some of you will seriously consider it. Safety has become not only really important um, generally nationwide, but in Texas. It has reached a point whereby um, it's almost all hands on deck approach to safety. And so, at, um, and so in this cycle, I believe that the additional funds that's made available, um, they, I think um, the virtual information meeting was scheduled for today, um, but obviously we are here in the meeting, but uh, there is plenty of guidance that's already there. Is that, um, Fortunately, it's not 100 page long um, guidance. It's actually a 30 page guidance you can look through. And I don't think that the uh, project uh, development requirement is really that um, involved. And so, in that sense, it, it's a really good program that, that, that we need uh, all those factors to benefit from. And we will be more than happy to provide any form of assistance that we can. So what would be, um, I guess what would be some examples of construction and operational improvements? Um, I would imagine guardrail. Uh, we wanted to document, which it's a significant document, it's a reason for it, um, There's a lot of stuff in there about how you great your, your signals. Upgrade the what? Signal lights. Oh, signal lights. Oh, signal lights. Signalization. To modernize stuff, which we don't have it in some kind of old way, but uh, that was one of my questions. It seems like most of these projects are tied directly to high old safety projects. What about what about signage? Because a lot of signage, it, it mentions, the reflectivity is shot and they need to be replaced. Very good. Well, I'm trying to think of some projects that the smaller cities. No, I agree. It's, it's a challenge to find a small city project. Right. Uh, that's kind of what I ran into a lot of this. And we replaced that base for a jerky wall. It's entirely. <laughs> Yeah, but the nice thing about that SIP is that, uh, that all the project um, proposals actually they go through the district, and so you actually have somebody to speak with. And so as you develop the project, you're going to process the development and speak with uh, the district to uh, make sure that it's a good project. Okay. Uh, I have one more. Sure. Just quickly, um, 
website is going to change. So well, the next time that you look, at them, you know, you you log on to it. So if you click my link in the website or Daniela's, <laughs> um, yeah. It's going to look a little bit differently. Hopefully, it'll be a lot easier to navigate, but I just wanted you to be aware that it's going to look different. And um, so you can still call me and say, Why does this look different? I might pick up the phone. <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to make sure I knew. Yeah, so city, of, our city of Waco, which yeah. most of you probably see, City of Waco is going to the new web system. And so, uh, so the MBO's uh, website is also going to go with it. And, uh, um, and so it's going to look different. I think it's better than, um, you know, so even in terms of content and how it looks and also how we submit them, it's better than what was there before. Um, so we're looking forward to it. Okay, so the next meeting will be Thursday, November 3rd. Same place, same time. Uh, request for agenda items to be considered for future meetings. Yeah, yeah, if there's anything that um, you can ask us today or just email us and we'll put it on the agenda. Very well. Yes, sir. Maybe ready for an I was ready for an adjournment. <laughs> 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 All right, we're adjourned. Yeah, we should do that.